Hello friends, welcome to my channel. I'm Somnia and today I'll be talking about the JVM architecture. Well, this is the first video of the Java series. So in case you want to learn Java, please subscribe to my channel. Now let's get started. Java was developed with the concept of write once and run everywhere in mind. And the JVM helps Java in doing so because the JVM provides an abstraction of a CPU and then it implements it for a variety of computers. So you don't have to worry about the hardware. The JVM does this. Only you need to take care is that you need to write a code that can run in the JVM. And then JVM will take care of generating the native code based on the CPU of that particular computer. This way, the JVM provides an independence between the hardware and the OS. Also, it generates a very small compiled code and provides a lot of security to the programmers from the malicious programs. It provides a set of specifications that you can see on your screen, one of which is it is a set of instructions and a definition of the meaning of those instructions. These instructions are called bytecode. A binary format called the class file format, which is used to convey the bytecodes and relates class infrastructure in a platform independent manner. Also, an algorithm for identifying the programs that cannot compromise the integrity of the JVM. This is called a verification process. Now, let's see how the JVM architecture looks like. But before that, we'll see a small application. I have created here a Java program. As you can see, that is the Hello World program. Here, the class is a Hello World class. And in the main method, I'm trying to print the Hello World message. When you compile, the hello world.java file using the java c command you get a class file and you can see the hello world.class file here and when i try to execute this program using the java command i write java hello world i'm getting the expected output i'm going to use the small application here and there to explain you the jvm architecture jvm performs basically two main functions loading and executing so it loads the class files into the runtime data areas that you can see here and then executes the bytecode instructions that are present in this class file using the native method interfaces and the native method libraries we'll be discussing the class loader subsystem in detail now well the class loader subsystem is divided into three phases loading linking and initialization let's first see how the loading works so loading is basically the creating of binary representation of a class. So what it does is it creates some chunk of bytes in the form of a class file and then introduces this chunk of bytes to the JVM as the implementation of that class file. So we have three uh, class loaders that will perform the loading of different kind of dot class files. Firstly, we have the bootstrap loader. The bootstrap loader's job is to introduce the dot class files to the runtime memory area that are present in the rt.jar folder. Now these are the native core runtime Java files. What this means is that these are, uh, these are the minimal essential classes like the object class, the system class, um, classes like the class class, the class loader class. All these are the essential classes which will help the entire application to load up after the initial classes are loaded. So the bootstrap loader is going to load these dot class files into the runtime memory area. Then comes the extension class loader, which is going to load the pre-compiled jar files, which are the extension files. Now they are present in folders like the ext folder or the jre folder or the lib folder. For example, if you need to connect to the Oracle database, you're going to use the ojdbc jar file. And this is going to be loaded by the extension loader. Third is the application loader. The job of the application loader is to load your application class files that are defined in the class path. So in my example, I had the hello world dot class file. So the application loader is going to load this dot class file into the runtime memory area. So this way you have all the three loaders loading different types of dot class files. Now when a file is loaded when it is when the program is executing of a class will be loaded only when it is encountered. So if a loader is looking up for a class file and it does not find it, it looks 
for that class file in the parent. So if a dot class file is not found in the application loader, the extension loader will be looked for that file. Then if it is not found there as well, the bootstrap loader will be looked for that dot class file. And if it is not found there also, you will get a class dot found exception. Now, when the files dot class files are loaded on the JVM, uh, it will know about some things about the class file. For example, the name of the class, the hierarchy of the class, and the fields and the methods of the class. Now, after the file is loaded, the linking of the file happens. So in linking, there are basically three phases, the verification, the preparation, and the resolution. Verification is basically to ensure that the class files that are loaded into the VM follow certain rules. The preparation is when you allocate some space to the static fields and initialize them to their default values. And the resolution is the dynamically determining the concrete values for the symbolic references in the runtime constant pool. Now, I'll be discussing verification first because it's very important and it saves a lot of time for the runtime interpreter. What verification basically does is the class files are loaded to follow certain rules. Okay. And these rules will guarantee that the program cannot get access to the fields and methods that it is not supposed to get access to. This will ensure a lot of security by a strong syntactic and uh, structural constraints. And what are these constraints are? In verification, it's going to ask basically these five questions that I have listed and check if the file is compliant to all of them. First is if it is structurally a valid file. So there's a magic number called the uh, cafe babe, <laughs> uh, which is going to check whether the first few bytes of the file are matching to this magic number. So that we know that it's not a garbled file or file that was never intended to be a dot class file. Secondly, if it's going to check, are all constant references correct? So what this means is it's going to check how many constants are there and whether the tags on the constants are valid enough to make them constant references. Sec third is are all instructions valid? Now, a method is basically a set of instructions and if these instructions are not correctly formed, then the method will not be able to execute. Fourth, will each instruction always find a correctly formed stack and local variables array? Now, when there's a method and there are instructions, instructions are going to be ha having some operands and some local variables. Now, all these operands are properly present in the operand stack. And also, uh, the local variables are, you know, when they are added to the stack, uh, they should not cause uh, an overflow or an underflow of the stack. So this way, we'll be able to check that all of these instructions are correctly formed. And the last point is two external references check out OK. Now, this is when loading all the classes that are referenced. Now, if a, a class is using some references that are pointing to some external classes that are present in the constant pool, then all those should have the correct references. So everything should be mapped correctly. This is one more uh, point that is checked during verification. Now, preparation, as I mentioned earlier, was when you are loading the static variables of the class and not the instance variables. So you're just loading variables which have the static keyword. So if I have a class with, let's say, uh, static int count is equal to two, then in that case, this variable gets memory in the runtime area and then it gets a default value. It does not get its actual value. So default value for an int type of variable is zero. So the static variable is going to be assigned zero at the preparation phase. And the last phase was the resolve phase where the dynamic uh, determination of the concrete values for the symbolic reference in the runtime constant pool happens. So the actual values are determined from the symbolic references. Now, the initialize phase comes into picture. In this, the class's initialize method gets executed. So if there is a static block in the class defined with the static keyword, or as we discussed, we had the static member as the count, then those uh, first of all, the static block gets executed and then also the static members are assigned their actual values. So then if the static in count is equal to two, then initially when in the preparation phase it was assigned the zero value, here it's going to be assigned the actual value, which is the two value.
the initialization phase can happen only after the linking phase is completed which means the verification preparation and resolution has happened for a dot class file moving on we'll be discussing the runtime data areas now the runtime data areas are the runtime memory in which all the various components of a class are allocated so there are five areas in total in which the class parts are allocated two of them the method area and the heap belong to the jvm so what happens is they are created when the jvm starts execution and then they are only destroyed when the jvm exists but the remaining that is the java stacks the pc register and the native method stack are created when a thread is created and then they exit when the thread exit exits so first we'll discuss the method area now the method area has shared among all the jvm threads because it is created on the vm startup it will store the per class data so every class will have its own class data in the method area and this will have a runtime constant pool the static variables and the method data so static variables are as i already told you one of the variables as i shown in the example and then the runtime constant pool is the pool of constants for a class okay like the name of the class the fields the numeric literals etc etc okay then we all know about the heap heap is famous for storing the object data so this is also created uh, on the vm startup and is shared among all the jvm threads and it stores the class objects now the important thing is that uh, in the object data is it will have slots for each of the non static fields in the class so non static fields for a car class would be the instance variables so like uh, we have the speed of the car or maybe uh, the gear the current gear the wheels or etc etc so these uh, all these fields will have their own slot in the object data then uh, the object the heap memory uh, is not explicitly deallocated so we have a proper memory management that happens for the heap uh, because when uh, the object is not able uh, i mean when the jvm is not able to allocate new memory in the heap to an object it starts giving the um, you know heap uh, out of memory error okay so that's why we have a proper memory management that happens for the heap next is the java stack now when a method invocation starts uh, basically uh, you know data space is created uh, called the uh, stack frame and what happens is that every time a jvm thread is created the same time the uh, java stack will be created so each and every thread will have its own java stack so uh, one thread would not know what is happening in the other thread so this way the method execution is very thread safe okay so here in the stack frame it will have uh, an operand stack and array of local variables and the pointer to the current executing instruction now operand stack is basically in the method you will have some operands and then you'll have also some local variables so it's going to have all these and also the pointer to the current executing instruction whichever instru instruction is executing at at this point in time will uh, the pointer to that will be there in the stack frame so what happens is let's say you have this stack frame so the important thing is that the top of the you know stack java stack the top stack frame is always the currently executing stack frame okay or the active stack frame mostly known as the active stack frame and what happens is let's say here a method another method gets called okay so a new stack frame gets added on the top and that becomes your active stack frame and then when the method returns the stack frame disappears and then again this stack frame becomes your active stack frame okay then comes your pc register okay so this is basically i told you when uh, there's a pointer to the you know the program counter okay uh, that points to the currently executing instruction so this uh, pointer is stored in the pc register okay for all the non native methods so methods that belong to the application and if there is any native method that is running then in that case uh, the address will be undefined okay now uh, the next thing is the native method stack now what happens in this stack is it stores the native methods now what are native methods that are methods that are implemented in some other language instead of the jvm instructions okay and mostly that language is c okay so that's why they are also called the c stacks and these native methods help uh, you know the jvm to execute some instructions that 
it cannot handle on its own so let's say maybe integrating with the legacy code so uh, such methods that are written in c are uh, placed in this native method stack and they are also allocated per thread when each thread is created okay the last part is so now we know that all the uh, you know bytecode instructions are loaded into the runtime memory area and the only thing left is the execution of these bytecode instructions so that happens in the execution engine which is done by mainly these four components so we'll discuss all of them the interpreter the jit compiler the hot pot profiler and the garbage collector so first is the interpreter the job of the interpreter is to interpret the current instruction so when i say interpret the current instruction it simply means that it translates the current instruction that's in bytecode into the native machine code for the cpu to process it now there's one problem with the interpreter is that it kind of uh, you know executes this uh, if a method is being called multiple times then it's going to interpret the same bytecode again and again so for example there's a for loop okay so which is doing uh, let's say some only just printing some uh, value then it is going to int uh, that many number of times the for loop will execute same number of times the same bytecode will be interpreted again and again which we don't want so what happens then the jit compiler comes into picture and it overcomes this problem of the interpreter by compiling the bytecode into the native code so then uh, it what what it, what the jit compiler does is it generates an intermediate code okay then optimizes this code and then converts it into the native code so um, uh, jit compiler will uh, create a native code ready okay and uh, for the methods that are executing multiple times okay uh, also the jit compiler uh, this way the jit compiler will be able to uh, increase the speed of execution so most of the times the jit compiler and the interpreter will work simultaneously okay then uh, these uh, spots in the code which uh, you know keep on executing you know very frequently are called hot spots so there's a hot spot profiler the job of the hotspot profiler is to optimize these parts of the program which are called the hotspot so it has a special you know it puts a lot of special effort in finding out techniques to optimize these parts of codes okay and last not the least is our garbage collector the job of the garbage collector is to manage the memory by destroying the objects that are not being used anymore so we call these objects that are not live objects it tries to you know collect them and it runs on its own by the jvm so we don't have control over the garbage collector more about the garbage collector in my next video so please do subscribe to my channel and click on that notification bell icon so that you get an update of my next video on gc till then i would like to say thank you for watching my video please do subscribe to my channel thank you